Yes. Senator Fallon will not be here this morning. Yes. Do something with insane authors. I can't remember something that came up at the last minute. Um, so how we're going to proceed this morning uh, is to hear from Damien on his strike all. There was some talk about another issue that's mm -hmm. going to be put on hold, so we're not going to talk about that in the confines of this conference committee at this point. But, uh, you know, uh, but we want to hear what you have in terms of, are you prepared both ways or just in terms of a strike all or? Um, so I prepared it as a strike all. I also prepared, thank you for reminding me, um, a summary of the changes. So this is your cheat sheet. And I could prepare it as instances of amendment. Um, so it's, uh, that's up to the committee. Do we have the dates? Um, Did he produce? Did he do the dates that we? I don't know. I said, so I said. So I the think dates. yes. I, okay. I'm sorry. Did you have something to say? I'm sorry. Just the date changes are not in there because the committee hasn't discussed them yet. Okay. So do we I have them in my table? Now? Okay. Um, and I are, can, are, you, are you prepared to discuss them this morning? The date, the proposed date changes. Um, yeah. Let me send them to Faith, and maybe she can print them off. Because um, I. That's the last issue that we really have to talk through. Right. right. Talk so, through, but I thought we would at least get a copy of the conference committee report and Damien could, um, what is your pleasure? Because I mean, I, I had, um, I had expressed my preference of willing to defer to you folks to do a strike all. Do you want him to walk through the strike all? Would it be enough to just highlight the changes we're making. I I don't need a walk. We had a walkthrough yesterday of the of the bill. Okay. Um, and I think this the reason I the reason we requested to have the strike all was for the benefit of the people who needed to read it, the people in the house who who have okay. requested no, I, that I, they I'm, see the whole bill. As I said, I'm deferring. We're to going you. to be working off of right. the shorthand. Right. So um, I'm glad to have both. Thank you for preparing um, both of them. But we don't. No, no, no. We don't need to go okay. through 57 pages. So uh, for one last time, then, why don't Damien? We'll take the report of the committee of conference, and why don't you highlight the changes that were made? Uh, essentially, um, as you know, we were very close last year, so we were working off, and we tried to incorporate the closeness in the Senate and proposal of amendment. So we're working off the Senate proposal of amendment with four, three or four changes. So can you highlight on what page these changes uh, are seen so we can look at them one last time? Yep, so they're, they're all highlighted in your strike off. Oh, okay, great, the um, yellow. Unfortunately, I forgot to turn oh. on color copy, okay. so they're highlighted in gray. That's okay. Um, We're all pretty gray. <laughs> but no, you're not. Beautiful silver color. So, um, and you'll also notice that dates are highlighted here. So, what I have done for the purposes of this in preparation for the committee is just bump everything forward by a year. Obviously, these dates could change further. I've just sent the House's dates proposal to Faith, so when she gets back, she can print it out for everyone. Um, so. Page two, these are just dates that will need to change. They're just bumped forward a year from last year's bill. Page five, it's just another date that needs to change. Page six, three more dates that need to change. Page eight uh, gets us to the audit language. This is the new audit language. When you, when you say needs to change, have you made the change in here? I have moved the dates forward by one year. Okay. Um, so they could stay the way they are, but the House, I think, has a different proposal on the dates. So, um, okay. Well, if I may. Sure. Um, and so that really when um, Representative Shai and I looked at the dates, it uh, was taking into consideration that it's January. And when the dates were thought of kind of a, a general assumption that May would be the passage date. And so taking into account that six months um, was part of our thinking of, of the moving the dates. So you have, substitutely, you, you have different dates 
Yes. It's not, you're not you like push saying, them out. You're not, okay. It's not, it's not just exactly a year. Um, you're trying to be realistic. You're trying to be realistic and trying to, uh, so it's, it's more like nine months. Yeah, it's more like nine months nine rather months than a year. Of a year. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see. A, we'll see. Yeah. A, apparently, yeah, and, we'll and, see. Yeah. And the reason for nine months is that if the last bill had become law, exactly. most of the effect would have been July first. Exactly. Here, right. If we get the governor to sign or override, yeah. it may be as early as February. February 1st. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it could. I mean, depend. If it's a very quick timeline, it could be as early as February fifteenth. And right. so that difference. Right. I mean, again, if it's a quick timeline. And, and so. the goal is to get this up and running quicker. Mm -hmm. If there's the same amount of lag time. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So it was exactly. just a review. It was just a re. Of, mm -hmm. I mean, a reality check of. Yeah. of the bill was written last again to reiterate. Yeah. The bill was written last year to pass July one, and all those all the RFI RFP language. Mm -hmm. So they they've stepped through and um, and and just looked at those dates, and we'll present them mm -hmm. in a minute. And just to say, to to say here's okay. here's the new reality. Do these work? Okay. Yeah. And I remember there was one date where we had a difference where we gave, I guess, the ramp up an extra month. And yeah, we were, I think you were saying yesterday that now you were thinking that that might not have even been enough. No, 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 no. I um, my so concerns with the day. My con I did not have a concern with the fact that you at the, the, the extra month that you added on was with respect to if the administration determines that a public plan is more feasible, right. they needed an extra. Month. What you proposed was the extra month for them to. Develop the plan and right. put it into writing. I, we don't have a problem okay. with that. The month, the, the issue that we had um, that brought up what we'll see in this list was um, was the was the timing of it. Um, in November, okay. Good. Right. Not not with that piece of it. I appreciate you doing that. Okay, let's go. Okay, so uh, the audit language was on page eight. Got um, it. Page nine has the new notice provision added in, and there's also a date uh, change in 573 there. And if you look at page 12, this is the change uh, to the bonding leave provision, so it takes away the cap on two parent bonding leave on page 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, page. Then we go a while. Page 18. Uh, this is the language that the Senate proposed here, uh, going on to page 19, where the Commissioner of Financial Regulation can also consider the relative value of, of medical leave that's provided in a private benefit plan. Same language you saw yesterday? Same language you saw yesterday. All I did was insert it. Okay. So, or with the changes that. I guess right. in this, it was, there were no changes that the committee asked for. But with all of these inserts, if there were changes the committee asked for, I made those. The editors looked everything over. And so this is good to go if, if it gets approved, apart from the dates issue that's still up for discussion. Right. Um, page 20, just date changes. Page, oh, thank you. Um, page 22, this is a technical correction on page 22. Uh, I caught this um, when I was looking over the bill for Senator Sirach in the fall. Uh, it's just a cross-reference. There are two ways that an employee that opts into TDI can opt out. Before, I only said it discontinues medical leave coverage pursuant to one of the ways. It really should list both. So. Uh, that's all that that does. Just adds in a missing cross-reference. Uh, let's see, page 26 and 27, just date changes. All the way up to page 36 and 37, more date changes. Page 38. This is new language around the notice provisions yeah. uh, with the changes that the committee asked for yesterday. Uh, so simplifying mm -hmm. what the Department of Labor has to do to just preparing a model poster um, and requiring that the employers provide written notice 
to each employee that there is in their employment on June 1st. That date might need to change, though, if the timeline changes. And then on the bottom of the page and the top of the next page, more date changes. Uh, let's see, page 45, uh, date changes, or a date change. Same on page 46, one date change. Pages 48 and 49 are more date changes. Pages 50 and 51, more date changes. Page 52, uh, this is just a technical change from last year's language. Uh, there was a change to this provision on uh, confidentiality of tax records that passed the legislature last year. Um, so this is just moving our paragraph down by one. We had proposed that we become paragraph eight last year, but that was added by the legislature in the spring. So, uh, page 54, uh, date changes. Page 55 is the Senate's proposed language on equivalency for the uh, family and medical leave plan agreed to by the governor and the BSEA. And if I, if I, just to see if I remember this clearly, this is to say that depending on the timing of the implementation of this, even if this is considered more generous, what the state employees agree to in a contract is held to that contract until the next contract cycle. We're, we're not, That's our intent. we're not, yeah, our intent is to protect the sanctity of the contract right. for the length of it, which is only two years, right. um, which given that this is going to take time to ramp up and it, there may not be very much time in between the right. two, but this is to say that contract doesn't get reopened right. because of this. Correct. Right. Right. Okay, thank you. And then the remaining changes on pages 56 and 57 are date changes. Uh, and then we just have a signature block. There's a period missing in there, which I'll add. Mm -hmm. I know. Oh my god! <laughs> um, Damien, where? What? Oh, um, a. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I missed this. Where is the uh, word process? Do what we can. Where, where is the audit provisions? They're early. They are on page. They were on eight. page eight. Eight. Yeah. Right. Did they get Did they get the things you wanted there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not oh, everything no. I wanted, that, but that represented what we agreed to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Carrie's not here today. <laughs> She's always here. In spirit. Yeah. And in our work. Okay, let's talk about date. Let's talk about the proposal of this. Okay. So thank you. This is not all of the dates, but this is the yeah. house's proposed date changes. To fill in. So if we were to just um, yeah. to, to simplify this, not only and to confirm what I'm oh, hearing. Oh, I gave you three copies. Um, yeah, I have a copy. Is that if we were to assume that this bill should it be signed or are overridden uh, by Let's say, just for discussion purposes, let's say April 1st, then all the days that were su suggested for changes by Damien would move up three months? Is that the concept? Yes, but different dates. So it, if you look at the chart, we had the assumed date of passage for previous, for last year, and then the proposed okay. date this year. So, so if those are some, if the second, if the proposed date of passage is wrong, then everything else backs up. But we we just use this for argument's sake, and then we can just move everything up or back depending upon what you think the assumed date of passage is. But given the timeline and the urgency to pass something, this is where we started. Um, last year, we we know what those were, and we didn't do every single date in the bill. But we did the major pieces, and then the other pieces can fill in around from it. But this, from the purposes of this, so we assume that. The date of passage would be by February 15th of this year, in terms of voting yeah. and timing and, and override if necessary. Yeah. Um, so it was your thought that you would include this just in a paragraph with a 
uh, conditional clause that would say if this is passed by X date, these new these new dates would take effect. Oh. I, I would look to Damien for the best way to do this. We I, didn't make any assumptions on that. That that would be <laughs> that's challenging to draft. Yeah. Um, we usually just put in dates based on presumed. You know, so in the spring, right. we you know will presume July right. one to give us some wiggle room. Um, right. Or often we just say things take effect on July one because you don't know if it's going to be signed on June fourth mm -hmm. or June twenty fifth. Right. Um, and we won't know that either. Well, well we know no, once we get to the governor, once once the leg days. this legislative process is complete and it appears on his desk, he has a date certain that he has to five days. Five days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. Uh, not that I think, uh, I mean, it could matter, but we don't have any obligation to override any time after. We could do it at the last day of the session. That's what we wanted to do. Uh, so there, is no, uh, there is no five day obligation. Right. We can write the schedule, right. the, an override date right. can be any, at any right. time right. after the veto. Exactly. Right. And that makes us a little. We made the assumption that there was a sense of urgency to pass a bill and get, start yeah. helping Vermonters. So yeah. that's, what we, that's what we did. Um, and yes, yeah, so this is that. So no, understand our assumptions, and then we can discuss what we want to change. Yeah. But that was the assumption that if there was an override necessary, that that wouldn't be waiting to the last day of the session. That that would be happening pretty soon after any veto that might occur. Is the is the trigger for all of these things primarily the assumed date of yes. passage and the assumed date of passage last year, and then everything yes. will flow from that? Yes. Yes. So that's, but then that makes it easy to change. If we need to change that first date, then the rest will flow by the right. same amount. But the, right. the one thing we did do at the very end, so in, in this case, we talked about when the request for information goes out, and we use the same timeline in terms of distance between things happening, time between things happening. Uh, responses due, uh, they, that was six weeks before. We said six weeks again. The RFP out um, two weeks later, June 1st. Choosing the insurance company, and that was where there was a concern about dates. If we just did it a year out with it being an election year, that would be August 15th under this scenario, so we don't have the election um, issue. And then we did delay the contributions begin and benefits begin because we felt that that actually had to happen in the following calendar year. And so, and doing it on a quarter, which is what we had done before contributions beginning at the beginning of April, so it's the beginning of a new quarter, and then benefits beginning six months later. We said January 1st and July 1st, um, 2021. So uh, those were each quarters for those and things to happen. So, is, Damien, I know you say it's hard to draft, yeah, but if we were to take the House's dates and put a notwithstanding clause in the end and say if uh, it passes, if it gets enacted into law more than 15 days beyond a certain date, then all those dates will be adjusted by, by six weeks. By, by however long it takes to get the sign. Um, Crazy things happen in this building. I, I understand. In terms of um, this could get in that. Exactly. That's what makes me a little concerned about putting exact dates in at this moment. Uh, and instead, it would be great to have a, a clause that gave us the opportunity to advance it all by six weeks or by whatever we yeah, felt. I, I might even take a, uh, if we did something like that, I might even take a more aggressive approach mm -hmm. as to the default position we start at, mm -hmm. but you have the backup if it takes a while to get it. Let's assume we, let's assume it does veto it and we want to override and for whatever reason we don't want to override till May, um, then it's, it's a little dangerous to because right. we can't change it at that point. Uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a way to do it. I don't know yeah, I'm not sure. Point. Because I think your point is a good one, which is if if, the, if it's all greased and, 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 and we do it, then it all actually happens. Right. Well, there's right. So that's why you had to have the starting early. assumption. So mm -hmm. that's, but at least it's a, it's a line so that if you change that assumption, the rest will fall in line. Well, from that assumption. assumption. And again, this gets to this gets to the, the issue that if if in fact the administration determines that on by August fifteenth that there is no RFP that would be economically more feasible than a public plan, 
then and they and they drop the plan for private insurance, then we already have a clause in there. I mean, the two month out clause that would change, right? It would just be whether it's a date certain or whether it's within 60 days after that determination. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That has its own trigger. You know, yeah. then then this, then these last three lines or these last two lines have to change because, of course, implementation of a public plan would be completely different than the implementation of a private plan. I don't know if that adds anything to this conversation at all, but that's no, just... No, it does. I, mean, I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, we're yeah. dealing with an aberration here. You know, how often do you got a bill that could possibly be going into effect um, upon passage in February that has so many things that yeah. follow? Mm -hmm. And so we might as well take advantage of getting it up more yeah. faster. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But we should be able to have our cake and eat it too and say, if that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. there's a way to let this be a f these be floating dates. It's no, not that's right. If people. there's a way to con concoct some notwithstanding language, I mean, there are other more, I mean, complications. I mean, there's a budget adjustment bill that's coming through. I mean, last year the budget adjustment bill didn't pass till May, but or April. But you know, usually a budget adjustment bill gets passed through by mid February or whatever. You know, there's and then there's the regular legislative process to change those dates before the end of the session as well. So if we can get a notwithstanding that that is phrased in a way that I need to do a little research to see if I can okay. make it. So, so I guess that begs the question then very quickly. What So what happens to bills where in a circum... I mean, again, this is a different circumstance. I don't remember seeing a bill that goes into effect in February 15th. But what happens to us in a situation where um, uh, we pass a bill like this with a date certain to start things and then people don't, you know, I mean, something else happens along the way, a veto override doesn't get scheduled or, you know, it, or, or something happens, you know, or something happens right. that, that, that the date is missed, then, mm -hmm. I mean, it, I guess it doesn't come across the transom often because we usually do things that are, I mean, the most complicated thing I can remember is that we've had to do, if we did a fix for this, and this went into effect on July 1, 2020. Sometimes I've, I've had a bill that had to go into effect July 2nd, 2020, you know, because you had to put that bill into place first before you could right. fix it. And, and you know, so I've, seen, I've had that happen, but I don't remember anything like this. I know I've seen many bills that were that have become law that have had effective dates of passage outs outside the two norms, one effective upon passage or effective July oh, 1st. Yeah. This plenty of them will yeah. say, this bill shall become effective on September 1st. You know, so you can set the date anywhere you want. I'm not sure why we couldn't say the RFI shall be due 90 days exactly. or passage or whatever exactly. you say. Right, if we did it by number of days. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So Damien is trying to figure out whether he is able to do this. Right. So let's well, I guess I guess that I guess that begs I guess that at worst, so the bill that the bill that the Senate passed, if it went into effect, twenty would have taken effect. We would have started collecting in twenty twenty, right? I mean, because right. this whole process would have been from yeah. July. Triggered in July. Would have been yeah. July to. Yeah. If, so if we ignore, let's just ignore that there's election day, just mm -hmm. for the sake. Some of us are still trying to do that. I'm really trying to ignore that. <laughs> um, We're just trying to do our work. But let's just ignore the calendar, I guess, mm -hmm. is a better yeah. way of putting it, and the fact that there is an election day. Mm -hmm. There's several. There's at least two election days. Um, if we do go to X number of days past passage, I, I think that may solve yeah. mm -hmm. both of those problems and get us right. to get us to a January 1 contribution mm -hmm. start, which which would be the only thing that, from here, that was a set mm -hmm. one-year delay mm -hmm. from what the set, from, from last year's bill, from the bill that we're working with. So, um, and that was working on a very tight time frame. Mm -hmm. And the only thing about that, if we, if we do it by day, then the time frame is only made more rushed by the determination of when it becomes law. Is that well, yeah. You know, but in essence, we're trying to say we're not really making it more rushed. When it became law, made it just 
comparable to what we thought it was last year. So I think right, but we have we have that we have, flex we have time, and we have three months of flex time. Yeah, between August and June. You have, three, you have three months, and unfortunately, every one of these, except for contributions to begin. Why did you it, explain it, to me? Maybe I just missed that's the six. It's six months. It's eight months on this one here. Now. It's eight months from February. From April 2nd, you have... No, no, it's three months from the determination of choosing the company, which fell within a, a, a calendar quarter issue. Right. Okay, so then... They're trying to... True if you start exactly. the contributions at the beginning. January 1st. So it's choosing... And then the benefits begin six months later. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the six months later is so that we can, as a state, collect the money that we need to for our admin of it. And so the first tax and the, department. And the first and premium. And the first, first premium. premium the, so we that, need six months of collecting before we're right. able to. Implement. That was so. it, that was in there before in the yeah. Uh, yeah. in the bill, right? The zero point one percent or whatever it was that we did for six months. I guess I'm. That has not little, changed. I guess I'm being a little dense. Are you substantively changing the? The lag time between between for any of these things from what we anticipated if the bill became law on May fifteenth. No, no. no, it's actually the same each yeah. time. It's the same distance yeah. between each of the activities. You're just trying to get things done sooner. So yes, we're all ready to rock and roll. So I was, January. I, yes. Oh, okay. So everyone is every one of them is equally right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So in essence, by having the extra time frame at right. the end of it from from the note of if it's a private company, it gives labor an extra x amount of days in order to provide you know to start preparation on notifications. It gives everybody just a little. But again, the January one start time Matt just mirrors the one year delay. Everything else, given the time that we have, yeah, to that's work nine with, months. It's nine months. Yeah, Nothing has changed. It's the same amount of time yeah. between each of these activities. Yeah, yeah. We're based upon a, yeah. based upon a passage date yeah. of February 15th. I just right. think yeah. embedding those specific dates may be a challenge given when it's actually not just passed, but when it actually becomes law. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so Right. Well, and what we had before was a whole lot of the bill was became effective on passage so that rulemaking could begin and um, the tax department and the Department of Labor could start doing the work that they needed to do administratively to get ready and, and DFR. So all the administrative pieces could get going. But but then the RFI went out. So we didn't change any of the time frames between activities. Because yeah. there are 15 of the 22 sections that are enacted upon passage. Right. Right. So, Damien, did you have a chance in your busyness over there to figure out whether you're able to do this? You're still working. So, um, just when you think you, you know, heard what, all. what we can do. Um, it's this is messy and not normal in Vermont. Other states do this. We can do something. So a lot of this takes effect on passage, so that's right. no problem. The problem is the implementation is right. a certain number of days after. That's so right. what we would have to do is write into the law um, 90 days after the effective date of this section, or 180 right. days after the effective date of this section. And then what that means is that when we go through a statutory review next year, we'll be putting in an actual date to replace that. Right. Um, so the, the actual law will look different when it gets into the green books yeah. than it does here. Um, so I can probably do that. It's, it's something we typically frown on, but it's yeah. something we can do if necessary. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, there, there are a couple of different ways we can do it, um, but it, this isn't really a conditional effective date. Um, because we're not conditioning it on the occurrence of another right. event. What it's conditioned on is whenever it gets passed, assuming it does. So, um, you know, whether that's January 30th or May 2nd, if you start setting everything out, so it's 90, 180, right. 360. Right. So regardless of when it's actually yeah. so passed. In right. terms of drafting, and obviously that's your area, but <laughs> is where you have the old dates in here, if you were to, the version you've given us, does it have everything in here just one year later, essentially? 
Yeah, so the version here has everything just one year later, so um, Couldn't we say? all of this is just July 1, 2020, right. April 15, 2020. Couldn't we just say that notwithstanding the effective date or timetable of, of these provisions, that they shall be advanced by the number of days that uh, this bill gets into effect earlier than May 15th. And let, let the people who read the bill figure out, do the calculation. Thank 57 days, this goes up because of that. I think it's safer if you just go through and say. 90 days after this, or six months after yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's just safer. Mm -hmm. um, the big issue with that, though, that I'd like to point out is that we have a quarterly payment system here. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're saying 90 days after effective and then you roll from there, um, or, or whatever it is, what you could end up with is a contributions beginning to be due for pay that started on April 17th, which is the middle of the quarter which is not something that employers calculate or track right now. For I thought the contributions had the one real date, which was January 20th. But, yeah, and so maybe those two have to go, have to be specific the beginning of the next calendar quarter or something like that, or the previous, depending. I mean, because if it's the 3rd of January instead of the 1st of January, then you could go back. But if it's so, March I mean, 28th, then you... One option would be to look at doing uh, timing the RFI and RFP process um, based off of from the effective date, mm -hmm. but then timing your contributions yes. and everything yes. else based off of a date certain. Yes, I think what that's I would, isn't that what, just what I was hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. go on. So I'm sorry, I was you were focused here doing yeah. research. Yeah. Um, I think we said so, the same thing, but yeah, yeah. you probably did that. Um, so, <laughs> I, I need to figure out if this works um, a little bit, so I, I would probably need to draft it out. Um, the so I, while you're a, a comment about that quarterly thing, Damien, if mm -hmm. if if it can't be January first and July first, it's then going to be April first and October first, in which case you might as well leave all the dates a year ahead and you don't have to do all this. The reason this is all changing is because we're making it happen three months or faster. We're all we're Right. But that's that's how we in the best of all possible world. Yeah. But otherwise you, you I don't know that you can have November fifteenth for choose insurance company and contributions start January first. I don't, I don't think that's possible. I, yeah, I think so, there's potential for right, some issues. Right. So, the, so if it ends up not being January first and July first, then you could just leave all the dates as a year out because that it would have to be April first and October first. Yeah. And, keep in keep in mind that its contributions are due from the quarter beginning January first. Right. So they actually won't be paid until March or April. Um, it's just the way the tax okay. system works. Is it it's April? Oh yeah. Two weeks after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, right. so, it's, so it's collected by the employer until then, so the money then comes to the state on April 15th, mm -hmm. which then pay for whatever. But yeah, employers need to be collecting, and this would only give them six weeks notice. Right. Um, with having been through this multiple years with drafting deadlines here, uh, two large holidays there yeah. that, where businesses shut down and so forth. Right. So, um, that it really only gives them about four weeks. Right. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's yeah, it's up it to you. Um, one way we can draft it is to say, um, <laughs> so I can draft the contribution and benefits timelines conditionally, right. and I can draft the RFI RFP deadlines uh, with sort of a hybrid language. So what I can say is, um, you know, so we're, well, we're looking at six weeks, basically, and I'll, I'll figure out the proper date 
length, but I think it's 45 days or 46 days after passage. So 45 and, and days after passage. Contributions and benefits would be date certain. But we, we would need to bear, bear with me. Yeah. So what we would say is uh, the um, RFI shall go out 45 days after passage, but in no event later than July 1, 2020. Right. Um, uh, yes. The responses shall be due uh, an additional 45 days later, but in no event later than August 15th, 2020. And then what we would say is if the uh, state chooses the insurance company by August 15th, 2020, contributions shall begin be due on January 1, and benefits shall be available on July 1. If the state chooses the insurance company after August 15th, uh, but in no event later than November 15th, mm -hmm. contributions yeah. shall be due on April 1. And October 1, it's complicated, but it would kind of allow you to um, have the best of both worlds where we can say, if things happen quickly and everything mm -hmm. gets done by February, you can move ahead and get benefits to folks earlier. If things are not that quick, then you go back mm -hmm. to the old schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that yeah. I think that it's actually so makes sense. Yeah. So, thank you, Damien. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there um, a possibility by it to interpret that to say we can just go longer? It doesn't matter because it says in no event later than. So the in no event later than is meant to basically. So imagine. Um, I'm not suggesting you do this, but imagine we run late again, like we did two years ago, uh, and this bill gets held up and goes out the door on June 15th. Yeah. 45 days after that would be a long time. Right. Um, so the in no event later than uh, basically caps it. Um, so once you get within 45 days of that July 1 deadline, you're, you're stuck with July 1. Yeah. I, I guess so, the late part, it's, it's let's say that we actually get this all done by February 15th. And then the next thing says 45 days, but in no event later than July 1st. Wouldn't there be an option to, no. to wait till July 1st? No. Yeah. Isn't That's it, my concern. Isn't well, that I, there, I think it's a valid point. It has to be worded in such a way that if you can do it by the early it, date, you should. You, you have, have to. to. Right. Yeah. So it, it shall be issued 45 yeah. days after passage. Right. Yes. Uh, no However, in no yeah. event shall yeah. the date that the RFP Fine. goes out be later that than July 1. OK, yeah. thank you. So yeah, it's, it will be a shall followed by a shall. Thank you. Yes, so, um, that works. It's, it's similar to the family leave piece that we were talking about yesterday. Shall be entitled to 12 weeks, but in no event shall it to right. Okay. Um, parent couple go longer than 16. Okay. So it's that same sort of concept where there's there's two um, two guardrails. We've Great. Been using that term a lot. Um, yeah. I have to think of a new word. With our EVs. You know, yeah. Well, <laughs> we apologize for making, having to make you do this, but I it, think it's worthwhile doing that. Thank you for. Yes. Thank you for. Yeah, yeah it'll take enough. me a little bit to work this up. Okay. Um, okay. And to work through the language, but I can I can do that. Um, uh, we thank would you. like to move expeditiously on this. When do you think you might be able to have something for us to look at? Um, great question. Um, hold on, I'm just writing things down. Um, um, Give me one or two hours. Yeah, yeah. just oh, yeah. go through. We're, we're, uh, but in no we're... event any longer than <laughs> <laughs> yes. that. Um, we are on the floor at one today, but I don't think we're going to be on for very longer. Long. Could you do 115? Let me check our floor. That way, David can get out this draft. Maybe yeah, you guys are on the floor at one, two. Two. We're on the floor at one, two. Let me just check the calendar. Tail feathers. There's nothing on the floor. 
We have nothing on the floor. Of consequence. Nothing no, on nothing. The floor. We're just have notice on nothing the proposal on the too. That's oh, it. Wow. Yep. So no one, one fifteen. Okay. Yeah, please and get to get to the conferees. If you get a draft done sooner on that, you can send uh, absolutely. it out. Absolutely, I'll send it out. So we can look at it perhaps in advance of one fifteen. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Damien. Welcome. Thank you, Joyce. I'm hearing through the grapevine that the proposal that Damien was putting together uh, is not sufficient for the House. Is that correct? Um, there is everything that we talked about this morning is sufficient. The one thing that we didn't get to um, starting last night that we didn't get to was the notion of uh, employee qualification and accessibility to as many Vermonters as possible. And, and the, the version that the House, that the Senate sent over to you is unacceptable now? Um, well, it's the same as what we passed over to you. Um, Slight tweaks. So. Right. No, and then we agreed. I think we we agreed that the um, time frame that you put on it and the way that you measured the time and matching up with, I believe, workers' compensation, just using quarters rather than months, was um, was the right choice. Um, we're just we're just hearing that it's um, having the eleven thousand four hundred dollar cap that we had passed and passed on to you is a pretty high burden for people yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. for a number for over I, there's been several numbers talked about about how many people that would affect negatively where they would pay into the system and not financially qualify mm -hmm. and so um, we wanted to be able to consider a lower amount um, ranging from well just a lower yeah. we'll start with a lower amount um, that would uh, mitigate that problem and try to offer this to as many Vermonters as we can, a acknowledging that not every program that we offer, I mean, every program that we offer does have bars to it, and there are people that do pay into things and, and do not see a direct benefit. Um, but we think that if there is something that, uh, a number that we can achieve that retains the work time qualification requirement, so the two out of the past four calendar quarters or whatever it is that you have is in the Senate version of the bill, um, tied in with a lower number would be um, a good improvement and for us and would probably gain us um, positive vibes in the, in the House, you know, just as a, just, just to make sure that we're achieving what we want to achieve. Because so much of this program is geared towards people of the, on, on the lower, that with it being a 90% replacement for people up to 27,000, we're acknowledging that people at that economic demographic have a real problem if they need to take time off. And so if we can try to lessen that for people who make even less than that, um, and, and according to the work that we've done with, the, with JFO, um, it's we as we're making an assumption that there will be no change in the tax rate there will be no change um, in the in, in what you're seeking to maintain which is that fairly static number so we, we would we would ask that you consider that so um, this is a a change that is not only different from what the House and the Senate passed, but is a significant change in terms of what we think should be the workforce attachment for people qualifying for this program, of which we took testimony at one point. We haven't taken testimony on a lower number. And there were all also other alternatives to not qualify those people, but to make sure that they got their money back that we haven't fully explored. So. Uh, I think we need to, as a Senate group, need to do some homework and regroup, and we'll get back to you if you want to have that discussion. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, what time frame are you looking at? Well, 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 I will email you or work through our council to set up another time. That's fine. Are you still concerned with finishing today? I would like to finish today. We have a, we have a serious wrinkle here. No, that's fine. And if there's, you know, again, I, I, I think, and we think that it's a, it's, like, I'm not. I appreciate that you have to work through, and the understanding of where we're coming from on it. And you know, we see it as a, we see it as 
continuing to connect the work, workforce needs. We're just lowering the bar for people. I think when we when we put that number in, we were anticipating that being uh, in in reference to seasonal workers, um, people who might work in a I mean in a ski area that that where they don't pay as much than other benefits, whether it's ski lifts or whatever. Um, that was that was kind of much of the thinking that went into that, and not necessarily um, what we've heard through. So you, you didn't want seasonal people to qualify? No, they would qualify. They, they, qualify, they qualify if they make if they make more than the minimum wage for the amount of time that they have to work. That's that's where the two quarters come right. in, right? Right. And right. so, in the bill. but there are but there are you know according to the information that that came forward through JFO through a walkthrough that we had that showed that there are a substantial number of Vermonters who, um, while the, the amount of money that they're paying into the program, I think is less, uh, uh, it, it's minimal. And if, and if we do end up with a minimum wage increase at all, um, would that, that number would be absorbed relatively easily um, by individuals, but that, that still people who don't there are Vermonters who do not. I mean, to me, the number that's six. If there's, if it's true that sixty thousand Vermonters do not make eleven thousand four hundred dollars a year, there's a larger problem at work. And that's a huge problem. It's and, a significant. Well, problem. I think we need a little bit more information yeah. about who those people are, and if that's one or two jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, and and that's fair. And I think we've asked, and it's really hard given yeah. the lack of data that our Department of Labor is able to tap into. Um, I think that if what we heard. What the, the initial walkthrough was that um, the Department of Labor came through with a particular number because they count jobs, not people. Right. So there, there may be a person with two jobs that we're, we know there are a lot of people yeah. with two right. jobs. Right, and right. then there are, and then the notion of what showed up in the tax numbers okay. is probably a little bit more accurate to that number. And um, uh, please feel free to meet with Joyce with the numbers that she prepared for us, or she may have otherwise. Just, but I, 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 I just want to be. I think I want to be clear on um, the just the simplicity. I think of what we're seeking is to keep that workforce requirement that you would have had to work all of the time that we have put into this, so that it's not just someone who can work for a week and then qualify but that they still have to show or have shown through their SS num and number and through the same work we already have in the bill that they are qualified to receive it through that work time, but that by lowering the, the bar on the financial thing, it takes into account that, I mean, I, my brother lives in Massachusetts, so there's not a direct correlation, but he has Down syndrome. He receives SSDI. That's not income that would be counted on this. This would be employment, but he is employed. He can only work seven or eight hours a week. Should he have the opportunity, if he were living in Vermont, should he have the opportunity to tap into that service? That's what we're talking about. Now, that's, that, that's one small example that doesn't really apply, but we could be talking about students at uh, a college that have a work-study program where they're paid seven twenty-five an hour because that's what work-study can pay. Um, where they're given $1,500 a year in work-study or $3,000 a year. So this is quite different from the conversations we've had before and what we were trying to achieve in addressing this problem. Now we're trying to broaden the program as opposed to making sure people don't put money in and not be eligible. It's a whole different thing. We had an agreement in terms of what the, and we picked up on what the House said, we agreed to it, and now you want to reopen it. That's basically it. Um, no, this was one issue that's been, that's been in the ether. Um, and this is just something that, I mean, I think we agree we are on the same page with everything else that's been put forward. Well, part, part of what was put forward before was also part of a package designed to make these people whole. And I'm not sure even what we have agreed to at this point is still acceptable to the Senate given what's being proposed now. So let us get back in touch with you. and. Um, We'll see where we go from there. Okay. Um, do you one final comment? Well, I think just just thinking of the the reference that you just made around making folks whole, and you've um, referenced the rebate before, but that's not been a topic of conversation that we've had. A refund. A refund. It would be a refund. Yep. And and so in terms of um, 
that that's to me uh, and to other conversations that we've had, that is a big policy change to have a, a mechanism for a refund in a program that's, that, is, that, that is, um, uh, in my mind, a much bigger policy change than lowering the income bar to include more folks. Because the, um, it, to me, it's a very different uh, program to have a refund in terms of, and you can hear from Joyce and she's sitting right here, but the, the cost of creating a refund, the cost of, of, of administering that would most likely be more expensive than something else. And so if our desire is to support those folks that are making under $11,000, it's, a, it's a, a simpler mechanism and fits in within our structure, I think, better to lower that $11,000 to something else. Well, so that I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that if we had the time to look into what the refund mechanism would be. We had, when we dealt with this bill, I remember originally Helen Head coming to me and said, the Department of Employment and Training has come in, so they need $10 million or $14 million to administer. And through my cross-examination, then we got them down to 800000 So they may say initially that it's going to cost this much money to process 300 refunds, and there may be another way to do it. I was hoping we can get through this process quickly, but we should do our due diligence to see which is the best way to get at this problem, and we should be clear as what we're trying to do. Are we trying to expand the program to people who have less connection to the workforce? There's always a work requirement in mostly all of our programs, whether it's UI and uh, health insurance. I'm, I'm sure we can ask Damien to do research, but that there's waiting periods to, to earn for everything. For, for everything. Healthcare and too. We UI. made one decision at what level that should be, and now right. uh, we're, we're, we're no. out of the blue. We're hearing another one. Uh, so. Uh, I no, I, I, I hear that and I appreciate that and I would just I would just ask while you take your time, um, we're available. Um, it's do your if you need to spend time thinking about it with uh, getting numbers from Joint Fiscal Office. She has them. Joyce has them. Um, you know, I and I don't want to I don't want to keep going on and on about the you know I mean the la I mean the last thing I will say is that you know anyone who who has has worked at this income level, you know, the benefit remains the same. It remains 90% of the average weekly wage that they would have for the, for the year. So it's not, we're not asking to pay these people out at the $73,000 that the $964 level at all. It's, it would remain. No, you're just asking to lower the threat, the, 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 the income the, threshold. The income so threshold. So we have the same time threshold, time work mm -hmm. threshold yes. is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's, you're asking us to consider a fairly major lowering of the income threshold. Right. right. Who are all, of people who are already paying in, so more Vermonters would be eligible to take the benefit and it would not cost the program any more. It would not change the cost of the program. And the, and the folks that are paying, they're already, again, that this is the issue that has come up. I mean, the Senate is aware of the, this issue in terms of saying there are people who are paying into the program and are unable to see a benefit from it. And this is just um, a request to consider that as not a broadening of the program, but as um, as a lowering of the bar to that program at at, at the at the lowest level, and and I'll I'll leave it from our side. I'll leave it at that, and we can determine right. what time we meet next. And I, and I would just say that the my understanding is the average amount of pay in for people at this eleven thousand dollar rate uh, is going to be about eighteen dollars. And the highest would be something like $24. Yet, in good faith, we tried to address that problem in a certain way. I think what's coming back is a more fundamental change of a, of a, of a provision of the law of the bill that both the Senate and the House have already agreed to what the attachment to the labor force would be in order to qualify for the program. So, um, yes. We will be back in touch, and um, we'll take it from there. Just may I just ask one last question? Because I can't remember how we established the income threshold. Why? How did we establish the income threshold at eleven 
too. Four. Well, 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 you you Let followed you more. followed our lead on that, and to okay. be right. I just need a reminder. And to be frank. The income levels were set, and the time threshold. The time thresholds were meant yeah, to match yeah. state programs yeah. that already exist. Right. The income Sorry. level came up in conversation because people became, as what happens at the end of a bill process, it stops being a good thing, and people start thinking that it's going to be abused by everybody else, and in terms of, in terms of um, double dipping or doing things that, and so there was this income. There was an income level that was a compromised position in the house in terms of in terms of where we would go with that in order to pass it. Um, people felt comfortable that that minimum wage, uh, a minimum wage course, income right. level, was sufficient. And I think for those of us who make well more than the minimum wage, uh, it's easy to say, well, absolutely, and that's a reasonable bar because we do have bars and in, in we do have levels that people have to achieve. We do exclude people, so. It's not like it's a purity factor per se, but it came towards, my memory is that it came towards the end of the process where, um, and I don't remember if it came from my committee or your committee, but it came at a time when the nuts and bolts were being worked out and it was, and it was put into place to make, to, with the assumption that there would be abuse of the program, which of, of which there's no proof of nationwide or in any other programs that this happens at a level that people are concerned about, but this is a natural progress of a bill that starts being about what it was about, which is, which was, um, quite frankly, a very women-centric issue of who's going to care for the family, who's going to take time, who can take time off, um, and uh, and it kind of evolved into this, just like this, con a nuts and bolts conversation, which gets um, kind of distanced from what the original intent of the bill was, and so this is, so the number came up with the idea that. Um, service workers, or anyone who works minimum wage, um, if they work for two of the, out of the four quarters and I make this the, much money. The time I'm hip to, I just couldn't, because the house was the determined. Yeah, no, it was, it was definitely a thing that came up based on, you know, based on a lot of distrust that the, that the program would be treated with respect okay. by the individuals, you know, that would, people would take advantage of it. I don't see it that way, but that's the way it passed through the house. And you're right. So, and I apologize if this seems like it's out of the blue. Um, that's that wasn't our intent. This was just something that's been in the ether, and we um, it, it we perhaps should have discussed it this morning, but I didn't. So, I mean, I I want to be clear that it's with more time and more study, maybe both sides would revisit the threshold number. But this is, uh, at, at maybe there's a better number, but this is something that had been agreed to, was proposed by the House and the Senate agreed to, and have it come up at this point, uh, even though there was, and I feel in some ways responsible because I made a good faith effort to address the, the concern that was raised, but to then go in to change eligibility for the program is, uh, is, is a different, is a beast of a different nature. So um, uh, so we need to talk about it, and, um, and I will be in touch with you or with... Uh, Same process we've been in. We're available. Yeah, yeah. We're available starting any time. So um, when you're ready... Open the window and chat. <laughs> okay. When you're ready to meet, we'll be ready to meet. Okay. Thank you.